but I, when she called yesterday, I suggested my, my remedy for this, which is um, lemon juice, a little shot of brandy, and uh, obviously hot water, cinnamon, nutmeg, and a little honey. I don't know whether you decided to use that. The brandy is just so that you get to sleep more than anything else. Well, thank you. Um, this is a, indeed a pr uh, privilege for me uh, to get a chance to introduce Jack. Uh, we met officially in 1992 when he became the superintendent of the Portland Public Schools, but it appears as though we probably met before that. And that was somewhere back in the late 60s, early 70s, when we both worked for the same political candidate in New York. Uh, we may have also possibly met when he was running around the country looking at alternative schools because 23 years ago I was teaching at Metropolitan Learning Center here in Portland. Uh, but the, the, the fact of uh, the connection in terms of the, the candidate in New York and the, uh, the, the politician in New York is that that candidate was very heavily involved. He had a passion for getting something done, for getting involved with people and getting things done. And I think that he managed to pass that along to everyone who, who connected with him. I feel that uh, it's something that I clearly see within what Jack has been dealing with in the time that I've worked at the district. In 1992, when he arrived, this was after Measure 5. This was after the state legislature had uh, approved the 21st Century Schools Act. And he began to wrestle with both of those things and has been doing so ever since. Now, of course, we have Measure 47, and we are all wrestling with that. But back in 1993, when I got a chance to get back into the school district at Jack's invitation, um, we have um, I, we've been I've gotten a chance to take a look at and work with him on a variety of issues. But the basic issue are our children, and it is uh, for me. I usually show up, show a picture of my two, uh, who are 15 and 18, and I do understand the the evolutionary significance of the cocoon. By the way. Um, teenagers, indeed, uh, with a cocoon would be a, a good idea at times, uh, <laughs> lately. Uh, but Jax, Jax has three kids, as, uh, three kids, and he, is, he looks, at it and looks at the district from the, through those eyes, as well as being an administrator within the, with the district. But it's very clear that the first, the first issue are the students and the youngsters and where they're going. And as a result, that is what he's been doing uh, in the time that I've gotten a chance to work with him. And I think you'll hear that in the speech uh, as well today. So without uh, going on, I'd like to introduce Jack Beerworth, superintendent of the Portland Public Schools. Chris asked if um, it would be all right if Lou introduced her as she was stumbling there toward the end, the, the thought crossed my mind that perhaps this was going to be like the runner who ran the first marathon, crossed the finish line, announced victory, and died on the spot, that, that she was perhaps going to get just to that moment of introducing Lou and sort of die on the spot. Um, we were talking earlier, and her voice was fading, and I was trying to get her to stop talking because it seemed as though there was a limited number of sentences there, and in fact, there was a finite number, and fortunately, it was right at the bottom of the page. I want to thank you for the privilege of allowing me to speak today and to bring you up to date on the state of our schools. There is a handout on your tables, and as you can see by this handout, we're starting with a pop quiz. These are just a few of the questions tomorrow's 10th graders will be expected to answer in order to qualify for the Certificate of Initial Mastery, Oregon's first of two certificates for completing high school. There are questions on the seat sheet for third, fifth, and eighth graders as well. You get to figure out which is which. If you think the questions are hard, you're right. I would only ask that you not spend the next half hour trying to figure them out. <laughs> the point here is not to stump the city club, but to impress upon you the high expectations we are placing upon students. Those expectations are part of the tough standards we've adopted for our schools, our teachers, and our young people. And they are part of the vision of, them, of providing a world class competitive education to every student in the Portland School District. Today I want to talk to you more about that vision and what we're doing to achieve it. 
I will talk only briefly about funding and the anticipated impact of Measure 47. I think that it is important to emphasize not just the amount of money we need, but what we need it for. I am reminded of a book called View from the 40th Floor, in which a man was desperately trying to keep two magazines from folding. He went to his lawyer to seek advice, and the lawyer eventually asked him, if you succeed in saving these magazines, what do you want to say with them? The man had no answer. The lawyer then advised him to think through what he really wanted to accomplish and said, remember, first the dream, then the dollars. Today I'd like to remind us of our dream of public education in Portland. We have set our sights very high. As best I can figure out, we have set our sights higher than anyone else in the United States, perhaps anywhere else in the world. Our goals are ambitious, perhaps absurdly so, but I would un want to emphasize that they are achievable. They are achievable. There is no question we need more funding, but we should also appreciate the progress we have made over the past few years in spite of funding shortfalls. Today, I'd like to share with you where we stand as a district and how we are performing compared to other public and private schools, where we're headed in terms of educational reform and financial challenges, and then how we can get where we want to go. Let me first give you a report on how well our schools are doing. In two words, amazingly well. Despite dropping from a budget of $355 million in the 92-93 school year to $321 million this year, six years later, student performance in the, public, in the Portland Public Schools is at an all-time high. We have successfully toughened and tightened our system to get better results from our schools, our teachers, and our students. The fact that our students are rising to higher expectations is directly due to the strong will, determination, and commitment of our teachers and staff. They have made extraordinary efforts to keep up the quality of instruction despite larger class sizes, inadequate classroom materials, and diminishing report. Because of their efforts, the Portland Public Schools are producing results as good or better than any other school, public or private, in the metropolitan area. Our SAT scores are higher today than they have ever been, as far back as we can track. Over 50% of our students take the SAT exams, as compared to 40-some-odd percent on a national level. Despite that, our students today are 30 points above the national average. And in fact, we are one point above the state average in math. As far as we know, we're the only major urban school district in the United States that is above the state's average in either of the math or reading SAT scores. Statewide, 16 of the 20 schools with the highest math scores at the fifth grade level are in the Portland Public Schools. Let me repeat that, 16 of the top 20 schools in the state in math are Portland public schools. The entire student cohort at each grade level is now performing one grade level higher than they did 10 years ago. That is that the average fifth grader today performs as well as the average sixth grader did in the early 1980s. We have essentially jumped a grade in our students' academic performance. Last. Our dropout rate is lower than ever. It is difficult to compare dropout rates from one year to the next or from one decade to the next because the criteria change. However, by any measure that we can figure out, we have the lowest dropout rate this city has ever had. Furthermore, we have pulled 2,300 kids off the street through our dropout retrieval program and have gotten them back in school, and because they generate state aid, they pay for themselves. The attendance pays for itself. We are serious about competing with anyone, anywhere. It is not good enough to have a better school system than, say, Detroit. We want the best school system, public or private, anywhere. We already stand out for the strength of our public school system. In, Port, some, in Portland, some 90% of our children attend public schools. That is remarkable compared to other cities. In Seattle, 
roughly three quarters, 75, 76 percent of their public schools, of their students attend public schools. Seattle is substantially larger than Portland, but we have 12,000 more students in our public school system. In addition, the Portland Public School District is one of only seven districts in the United States to receive a grant from the Pew Charitable Trust to develop a standards-based education system. Our $800,000 grant, $800, grant is being used to train teachers and restructure curricula to fit the new standards. As we speak, a group of teachers and administrators is over at the Terwilliger School District, over at the Terwilliger School developing those standards so that we will know in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grades, where students need to be and can tell students that and parents that. We are also participating in a Pew Grant with the Oregon System of Higher Education that will help us make the link between our K-12 institution and proficiency-based admissions standards that the university will be implementing in a few years. We believe that this link is critically important. At present, 77% of our high school graduates are going on to two-year or four-year colleges. Statewide, only 26% of the students who enter college actually complete their higher education in four years. The overall completion rate is about 50%. We need to do a better job giving students the skills and knowledge they need to see succeed in college as well as in the workforce. Over the next several years, you will see sweeping changes in what and how we teach, what we expect of students and teachers, and how we run the school system, all aimed at producing superior results. The Oregon Education Act for the 21st century is our springboard for implementing two simple but major concepts. In fact, I'd call them revolutions. First, high standards. Our standards-based system raises the expectation for student performance at every grade level. In addition, all schools are held accountable for meeting district-wide goals and standards while being given the flexibility to decide how to meet them. Furthermore, these standards are based not upon seat time, but what a student knows and can do, proficiencies. I have used as an example my own education in terms of French. I took seven years of French before I got to college. However, if I was asked to order in a restaurant, I could have probably ordered. I'm not sure I, I know what I would have gotten for my order. What we want is students who can read, write, speak, and listen to French, not just simply have sat in a classroom for seven years. Parents, teachers, and in some cases, students are directly involved in those decisions through each school's site council. Second, we have adopted a vision. All students achieve. No excuses, no exceptions. Let me repeat that. All students achieve. No excuses, no exceptions. In the past, student performance data resulted in a bell curve. A few really high performers at the top a few non-performers at the bottom, and a lot of students at the average in between. In the future, we are aiming for something entirely different. We have essentially drawn a line, a continuum of achievement for all students, and we are focused on helping every single student come up to that level. If you walk through the halls of Roosevelt High School, a school that has achieved remarkable turnaround in its student attendance, motivation, and performance, you'll see signs on the wall that say, all means all. No student overlooked, no student left behind. We are committed to, those, to setting the standards and providing opportunities for each student to learn and making the extra effort to get him or her up to the standards by hook or by crook. It is no longer acceptable to us, and it should no longer be acceptable to people to set standards, give kids the opportunity to learn, and then if some of them make it fine and some of them don't make it, OK. That should not be acceptable. It is not good for them. It is not good for us. It is not good for the community. We cannot afford to allow a certain percentage of our population to write themselves off, to accept less for themselves. By hook or by crook, 
we intend and must push all kids to achieve high levels of proficiency. The ramifications of that kind of individualized teaching are enormous. How will teachers give each student the attention he or she needs? What new teaching materials will be required? How will the special needs of minority, handicapped, low income, and non-English speaking students be met? What accommodations will be made for different learning styles? The more you think about it, the more vast the implications. For, as one example, the goal of holding all minority and limited uh, non-English speaking students to the same standards as everyone else is something which people have talked about, but let's be honest, have never seriously committed themselves to. It is an essential hypocrisy of our society that we have talked about the same standards for all kids, but when willing to accept different standards for different groups of kids. That should no longer be acceptable to us. What a kid learns anywhere in this district, anywhere in this state, should be equally competitive, and we should make the same effort to get every single kid up and over that hump. It will require a level of professional training greater than we have ever expected of ourselves in the past. Our vision for the Portland Public Schools calls for high standards of academic performance for all students, strategy and curricula to help those students reach those standards, not just the students who are going on to college, assessment of student progress based upon proficiency, so we advance students based upon what they know and can do rather than the amount of time they spend sitting in class, a seamless system of education that ties K-12 education with what is expected and required at Oregon universities, and safe schools where students are not only protected from violence but also from intimidation, mistreatment, and harassment. We have chosen this vision because we believe in it because Portland deserves nothing less. This is the best, most effective way to teach kids what they need to know, period. And it is the best way to prepare them for productive, satisfying lives as adults. But without the necessary funding, and willpower, these goals will turn into pipe dreams. From 1992 to 1995, we cut 630 positions in the Portland Public Schools, almost all of them in administrative and support areas. During that period of time, class size was not raised one bit. Our administrative costs, by the way, are only 5% of our budget. Last year, the cuts went deeper into the classroom. We originally eliminated 513 mostly teaching positions, but we were able to restore 213 through the help of the city, the county, the business community, and the march for the schools. Next year, our best case scenario at this point is the governor's investment budget. If that level of funding is approved, we would lose 400 to 500 more teaching positions. Class sizes will go up, programs will be cut, and the quality of education will suffer. I have talked with my colleagues around the state, and the picture is the same. Perhaps not as deep cuts, but all districts would be moving backwards. Much of the debate around education seems to center around what are we getting for our money. Let me say unequivocally, Portland and Oregon are getting a bargain. That becomes clear if you compare how much we spend per student now versus what we spent in, 1990, in 1982, and then consider that SAT math and reading scores around the district are much higher now than they were then. We are producing better results for less cost. But we didn't produce those better results overnight. The high scores we're seeing today are the results of what we put into place 12 years ago. Lower class sizes, special programs, targeted efforts for students with special needs, and other initiatives. We're getting the payoff now. But because of inadequate funding, we're starting to lose those initiatives, one by one. The increases in class size are obvious, but we've also cut talented, excuse me, counseling, the talented and gifted program, and we no longer have a curriculum department. The heroes through all of this are our teachers and our parents. We have schools without paper, 
textbooks that need replacing, PTAs paying for supplies, and classes that are more and more unwieldy. The fact that our teachers and staff have withstood the pressures and uncertainty, not to mention the drain on their own time and finances, speaks eloquently to their professional pride and dedication. But we cannot keep going on pride alone. If we want to get the very best we can out of our schools and our students, we need commitment and money. Getting schools to come to school every day, to turn off the TV and to do their homework every night doesn't cost a nickel more. It is simply a matter of willpower. On the other hand, we cannot keep taking money out of our school district year after year without some fallout, not the least of which is demoralized, overextended teachers and staff and parents. What do we need for the future? We need elected officials, business leaders, and citizens to stand up and commit, to themse commit themselves to this vision once and for all, and to say this is what we want, and we are going to do everything in our power to make it happen. Then we need the willpower for them to put their money where their mouth is. We also need decision makers to free the Portland Public Schools and other districts from burdensome rules and regulations that do nothing to enhance the quality of education we provide. I have recommended, and a number of people are considering, that the Portland Public Schools become a charter school district. Under such an arrangement, we would have a contract that would free us from what state rules, say those governing, scheduling, school hours, spending, and curriculum, but because our students would still have to meet certain academic requirements required by the state, this would give us more freedom and flexibility to compete while holding us accountable for the results. Becoming a charter school district will also free us of some of the politics of public education and help us get more connected to the very people we serve, students, parents, and the community. The Portland Public Schools is an exceptional school district with exceptional people, but I believe that we are pushing the limits at this point in terms of current funding and operating restrictions. To truly go for it, to make this dream of high achievement a reality for all students, we are going to need stable and adequate funding and more freedom to get the optimum results for every dollar we spend. We are at a break point in terms of our ability to stay on, on the path we have chosen for ourselves. So this is the real test for today. Are we ready to come together in a, as a community and fully embrace this vision for our students? Are we willing to do all we can to support it and achieve it? We saw how this community feels last June when 30,000 people marched through the streets of Portland. But we need more than walking or talking. The City Club has long been recognized how important a good, a great school district is to this city and this state. Two years ago, the Wall Street Journal reported that the fate of Oregon's economic status is tied to the quality and funding of its schools. Portland and other schools are at a critical juncture. Portland is growing from a small town to a major metropolitan area. Thus far, we have said we refuse to compromise on the qualities that make us special, on the values we hold dear. I would submit that nothing is more precious than the education and well-being of our children and the knowledge base that we create for the future of this community. A strong educational system is absolutely essential to a healthy economy, and it is the cornerstone of our livability. The quality of life we enjoy in Portland, our growing economy, the spirit of innovation, public safety, the strength of our neighborhoods, enjoyment of the arts, and family life, all of these factors and more are linked to the quality and effectiveness of our public schools. As one parent and a business person once told me, people need to understand what we have and what we are on the brink of losing. Forget bake sales as a way of mending the situation. The stakes are very high. If we fall off our path at this point, we will have lost the ideals that drive us and our schools will begin to spiral down. But if we win, we will have shown that we can continue our high quality and do what no major other city, excuse me, no other major city has. Create a public school system that really works for all students. One that is competitive and one that turns out highly educated students one after another after another. We will have given each child who passes through our doors a golden opportunity, a 
chance to reach for the stars and come out a winner. It is high time we put the full force of our commitment behind this dreams, behind this dream. The Portland Public Schools look forward to working with you to assure that the people of this unique city have the high quality of public education they need and deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. I think we all appreciate that we have a treasure in you and we appreciate the things that you've done. Uh, especially since the early 90s and Ballot Measure 5 passed, uh, we know that that's been uh, difficult and it sounds like you've maintained very well and improved in some areas. Um, I'd like to follow up on your thought on the Charter School District. I'd like to know, uh, will this change the funding situation in the Portland Public Schools? Will it mean that you can maintain some of the programs for which the, uh, the, pro the school district has become known? And uh, do you expect that it's realistic to think that Portland Public Schools could become a charter school district? Um, if I believed in realism, I probably wouldn't be here. Um, I'm not willing to accept reality as it is. I want to make a reality that makes sense. I don't know whether becoming a charter public school district makes sense, I mean, is real or not. I think it makes sense because I think it is time for the community to seize control of its own destiny and for us to start from what it is that we want to be as opposed to what are the regulations and how do we implement them better. We have, and as a matter of fact, also going on at this moment, a process started uh, by our board chair, or what former board chair, Lucius Hicks, which has been called class action. It may lead to becoming a charter school district. It is a process to fundamentally examine the very essence of the school district, the basic ground rules under which we operate. I believe that that is essential because the academic targets we have set for ourselves require us to take a look at the way we, way we govern ourselves, the way we hire teachers, the standards those teachers are hired under, and say, are these the rules by which we should operate if we are truly serious about achieving the academic results we want to and achieving them for all kids? Um, I think we've got to do that. It will not solve the funding situation. I don't think it's probably relevant to, one, to it one way or the other. I think it will, however, help us um, achieve the results. I have used as an example, and I used it in my speech, Roosevelt High School. To the credit of the teachers and many of the parents in Roosevelt High School, they looked at themselves a number of years ago and recognized that at best they had a second, perhaps third-rate high school. And having looked themselves in the face and said that, their next step was not to ask for the school district's board policies and administrative regulations and the state, uh, guide, and the state regulations and ask how to implement, the, implement them better. What they said to themselves is, what does Roosevelt High School need to be to deliver a high quality of education to the kids in North Portland in this day and age? And once they had gotten through that process, they then said, what are the regulations we need freedom from in order to, to do what we have decided to do? While it may seem preposterous, that is what we are trying to do for ourselves as a whole school district. And in a sense, it is preposterous. Can you go through that kind of examination in a school district with 58,000 students? On the other hand, if you do not, then you are, by, you are tacitly accepting that you must operate by the rules as they have been drawn up over a period of time. And I am not willing to accept those limitations, not if the objectives are serious. Another question. Somebody's coming forward or else he's trying to get out. Uh, Larry Shaw, City Club member. You mentioned the um, governor's investment budget. Yes. 
and you mentioned a number of teachers that would be cut under that best case budget. Could you explain why uh, the governor's budget does not uh, maintain at least the current level of expenditure? And could you add an explanation about the impact that the lack of assistance from the cities and counties based on their problems with ballot measure 47 contribute to that problem? Sure. The numbers are pretty simple. Uh, we have a budget this year of $321 million without outside funding, city, county, business community, and parents, the budget would be 302. Um, the governor's investment budget for Portland would yield a total bud general fund budget of around 311, 312, 313 million dollars, depending upon certain factors. That leaves us substantially short of where we are today with the outside funding, which given the nature of 47, and I see Charlie Hale standing there, so unless Charlie is willing to stand up and, no, he's not, he's got empty pockets. <laughs> I had hope, Charlie, I can always hope. Um, unless the city and count, unless they were able to come up with money which we did not expect, they had made it quite clear that it was a one-time uh, grant that they would always do their best to assist us, but that those were one-time grants to tide us through until the next session of the legislature. But going back to my numbers, we are substantially short of where we are with the outside funding. Um, we are sh the amount we are short is the equivalent of four to five hundred teaching positions. For even the lowest spending districts in the state who are being brought up, the governor's investment budget would mean an increase of two and a quarter percent. And if you read the article in the Oregonian on the front page on the left-hand side, there was um, the reporter had talked to a number of districts around the state, and they were either going to be cutting or digging deeper into their fund balances, even under the best case. So we are not, it is perhaps a bit more extreme for us because we are losing the outside funding, but the situation is similar across the state. Yes. I'm Emma Lydia Mount Holmstrom, a teacher, author, and advocate for great education. First, let me commend you for the fine job you're doing in the Portland Public Schools. Your principals are now very visible, your teachers are dedicated, your students are trying but there's always room for growth. And in view of responsible teaching as a retired teacher, I think you need to disallow eating and drinking in the classroom in the public schools. We need to be role models and inspire students to learn. It is irresponsible to allow food and drink in an ongoing teaching situation. I dub you, sir, Mr. Superintendent, to do something about this. This practice, in spite of funding shortfalls and our food machines, which need the money, I guess, is just unacceptable. We need to higher our expectations to develop our future leaders, and it's I'm counting on you to help. <laughs> what? Did you have a response? May I Thank count you. on you? I'm not. 100% sure of what you meant by eating and drinking. Um, there may be things going on in our schools that I don't know about. Hopefully, if they're eating and drinking in one way, they're having a great time at it, but we certainly don't condone uh, eating, and, eating and drinking of a variety of kinds. Uh, we, have, we serve food. Well, Students are supposed to be eating lunch at lunchtime. Uh, we don't have enough seats in most of our cafeterias so that students are sitting outside. Let me say something, though, in all seriousness. Given our funding situation, and I don't know whether this is the situation where you're referring to, because I'd, and I'd be glad to talk to you afterwards. We have students and teachers, particularly in our high schools, who are giving up their lunch times in order to take classes and do things or meet informally in the classrooms and are eating their lunches um, at the same time they're trying to, do trying to do academic work. 
they are doing this because our schedules have gotten squeezed and obviously from the shaking of your head it's not what you had in mind but but, but let me but let me tell you that people are managing the best they can under the circumstances and we do have people coming together and teachers not having not taking their lunch periods working through their lunch periods and working with students during their lunch periods we also have students who because of course schedules cannot take what they were able to take two or three years ago trying to cram together lunch and academics obviously there's more but i, I let me turn to Charlie Hales. Charlie Hales, City Club member. Uh, first, Jack, as a citizen and a parent, I want to commend you for both what you've said here today and what you've accomplished. Uh, we are making progress as a community, even under financial duress. But, but I, I'm a little frustrated here, and I want you to help cure that frustration. And I suspect many of the thousands of allies you have are as frustrated. And that is, you've described an unacceptable situation in terms of the governor's budget. What? path do you recommend to get away from that unacceptable situation? You have 30,000 people who are ready to march behind you. Which path do you want us to take? And I think as we go into the legislative session, the educational community, all of us need to know uh, what the cure for the deficit caused by state policy will be. Thank you, Charlie. Um, let me start with a little bit of background. I, I indicated that state funding for schools has not changed. On a per student basis, the dollars per student statewide today are lower than they were in 1991-92. Let me repeat that. If you read the newspapers, if you listened to the sort of folk wisdom, your assumption would be that more and more and more dollars are being poured into schools. The fact is that they are not. The state budget to pay for schools has gone up, but that's because of the backfill for Measure 5. But the total number of dollars has not, has not even kept pace with student growth, much less with inflation. So we have not poured more money in. But the argument about the amount of money is the wrong argument. It is the wrong place for us to be starting. What I would like to see us do as a community, and if we can bring the whole state into it, and I believe based on my discussions with other community, with other superintendents, other school board members, other elected officials around the state that other people are feeling the same way, is to start the discussion where it should have been five years ago when, we, when Measure 5 was passed and when House Bill 3565 was passed after that, which is, what is it that we are expecting of our kids? What do we want for them? And then if we believe in those things, how do we figure out how to pay for it? Unfortunately, the, the debate over school funding has been simply one of numbers. Is it too high? Is it too low? Not what are we trying to do and how do we get there? So I, the thing that I would ask first and foremost of myself as a superintendent, as a parent, from you as an elected official, and as a parent, and everybody else who's listening and cares to do this, is to demand that the discussion in the state legislature this time around do what it has not done the last several sessions, which is to say what kind of a public school system do we want what kind of expectations do we have for kids? What are reasonable class sizes? Do we want our children to get art and music and to have a librarian in the library? Do we want a variety of things? And then if so, how do we achieve those? I probably shouldn't say this, but if we all go out of here and simply demand more money, my guess is that we will lose that discussion. If, on the other hand, what we say is we want reasonable class sizes and we want these things for our kids, I think we have a good shot at it. Um, and we need to do it right away. The legislature is going into session on Monday. 
but six months from now, we will start a new school year. It may be unfair to the state legislature, and I see some legislators in the room, but the system is set up to only give the state legislature a very limited period of time. So we are going to have to have a very condensed and intensive discussion. But we cannot say to the school children in Portland, don't come back to school in September because we haven't figured out the solution to this and we need more time to argue it through. They are going to be coming back to school in September. And if we don't figure it out before then, we will probably lose parents and teachers. And we will lose good people. This past year, the Portland School District alone had 300 teachers resign, not retire, resign. Not necessarily people who had been uh, rift because they were in danger of losing a job people with two, three, four, five years experience. Why did they leave? They left because they were frustrated, because they wanted to go to a place where they could build their careers, because they were tired of having their jobs on the line year after year after year after year. They wanted to go to some place where they could, where they knew they had a future and could build. We lost a lot of good people. We cannot afford to lose people like that again. So even if we don't have very much time, we have to say to the legislature, have that debate. We want to be part of it, and we want to make it clear to you that as parents, and if we are not parents, as friends, neighbors, grandparents, as businesses, that the health of the public school system is absolutely essential. Let us understand what we are, what we are trying to do and then figure out how to get there. It is a discussion which, as far as I know, has not taken place for six years. And it is probably part of the reason we've gotten ourselves to where we are today. Marie Morgan, City Club member. I'd like to invite you to build on that even more, if you might. In addition to the legislature, um, the flyer that went out today announcing the program referred to not just money issues, but leadership issues. So I'm wondering if you can give this very educated and motivated audience um, some more specific actions that might best leverage the limited time we have as citizens to go further down this path. One of the things that I've learned as a newcomer to this state and I still feel a newcomer, is that if this state chooses to turn on a dime, it can. We still, even though we now have uh, three million people, we still believe in ourselves as a community. We still hold to the notion that we are a single community. And if we say, as a state, this is something we want to do something about, we can make it happen. If the legislators who are in this room and elsewhere heard from us as a community, this is an issue that's got to get dealt with. Please deal with it, and we will support you. And I want to underline that last part. We will support you because this is important enough to us. It will happen. Conversely, what we must fight is what is a number of things that are all fairly similar, but that I have heard over and over and over again. I've heard them in the last several weeks, and I've heard them over the last three or four years. People told me that nothing would happen until blood ran in the streets, until people are hurt and things are hurt across the board. Maybe. But as a father and as a superintendent, it goes against every single thing that I stand for 
to allow kids to be hurt in order to get it across to adults that they got a problem and they've got to solve it. We decimated the school district in order to save class size and to save programs. We must say to people who step before this club, who stand up in the legislature and say, the people have spoken through Measure 47, let them roast in their own problems, that that's nuts certainly as far as it applies to kids. I didn't hear anybody who voted for Measure 47 as I went around canvassing, and I met many people who were wanting to vote for 47. I didn't hear anybody say, destroy the public schools. I heard people who were frustrated with a property tax system that was inequitable as far as they were concerned. We have got to say to the legislature, take the action now. Do not let the ax fall. Do not let us be proactive. Let us not simply assume that the only way you can do things is if they get to be so bad that everybody sees that it's a problem. I didn't elect my legislator to just sit passively by and wait and let it happen. I didn't think that the Portland School District hired me as a superintendent to just let things happen passively. But they need to hear from us that we will support them in that debate and in their efforts to find solutions. And finding the solution may in part mean going back out to the voters later this spring. But let the legislature hear from us that, that we as adults want to see problems solved and that particularly we don't want kids and, and, and the defenseless in society hurt before the solutions are found. Because it will probably not be people like us and our children, the people in this room, who will be hurt. It will be society's most vulnerable who will be hurt the most when we fall into that. Ann Ford, City Club member, a school administrator for Northwest Regional ESD, and former public school music teacher. And by now you of, of which there are fewer and fewer. <laughs> by n <laughs> and I was going to guess you could anticipate what my question might be. In these times of truly difficult decisions about resources for public schools and educational priorities, and in light of recent brain research about the importance of arts education, in learning and cognitive development in students, what are Portland Public Schools doing to ensure a rigorous and systematic arts education for its K through 12 students? I see Bill Crane sitting right behind you, and if I don't answer this well, um, I'm in trouble. I'd like to give you an answer that said that I absolutely, totally believe in the arts and that all kids should get arts experiences and that what we've got in the Portland Public Schools is good but nowhere near where I'd like it to be. That's true. But I've also got to tell you that the reality of the Portland Public Schools right now, if we are willing to look it in the face, is that we are providing students with an inadequate education and that if you drew a list of things that kids should be getting in the arts, in math, in science, and in a variety of other areas, we are at this point choosing to give some and not others. And whether it's the arts that get shortchanged or some other area, we are not providing kids with a complete education. And that fundamental um, decision is one that disturbs me a great deal. We turned the decision in Portland over to the buildings this past spring and said, 
if you are going to have inadequate resources, we will let you choose which teachers and programs you cut in order to figure out how to minimize the impact on kids. But know in advance, this is from myself and from the school board, know in advance that we will not chastise you for shortchanging kids because we know that whatever decision you make, one way or another, it will leave kids short. Um, music is one of the areas that's been hit. And whether it's brain search, research, or simply the wonderful things that music does to enrich our lives, it is a shame that kids don't have the full range of experiences that they ought to. Um, I didn't learn how to play an instrument. I wish I had. It took me until I was an adult to really understand and appreciate music. That's a shame. Um, I, didn't, I had a great education, but there were pieces of mine that were missing. I don't want to see kids in Portland miss those things. Um, by the way, let me take something sideways. And it sort of segues to one of the wonderful things about Portland. Whether it's school business partnerships or artists and residence programs, there is an involvement of this community in this school district that is like nothing I have seen any place else. Um, we are starting a writer's foundation. We have professional writers in this community who are willing to come into the schools and share their expertise with teachers, with students. We have people in all fields who are coming into our schools and sharing those things. Um, it's wonderful. And if we didn't have those, our schools would be significantly less rich. But we need an awful lot more of that. And you know, I know what you like as an answer is that I want to protect the arts, but you know, under these circumstances, we protect the arts, science suffers. It's not acceptable to me to be shortchanging any of those areas. Because the reality is that an incomplete education is an incomplete education, and kids are getting shortchanged. I am sorry, we are just plain out of time. Um, it's obvious we need more of you <laughs> as well. Um, I thank you very much, Jack, for talking with us today. And I ask all of you to join us next week for the State of the City Address for Mayor Katz. We are adjourned. Thank you.